so let's get a backstory in. What what got you involved in dogs in the first place? Um, well, uh, my my people had a farm uh, growing up, so you know I I was always around animals. Um, you know, my mom worked German shepherds, bred German shepherds. My uncle had huskies. My grandmother had old English sheep dogs. Um, I know there was a couple other people, uh, that had dogs and then they just had like these crossbreed dogs that were on the farms that were mainly German shepherd collie crosses. And so, you know, I'm five and six years old, you know, helping them, you know, whelp these litters. <laughs> you know, I really had no clue what I was really doing, but you know, I just did what they told me. Um, you know, so, you know, from the beginning, there was always a dog around at least one, you know what I mean? It's always a dog around. Mm. Um, so, you know, that's where it started. And then, you know, obviously as I got, you know, older, seven, eight, nine, ten, you know, where I could, you know, I'm, I'm reading and able to understand things better. Um, you know, I started doing a little bit of research on my own about some of the breeds that I had, you know, been seeing on the farm or in the backyard and things like that. Um, because, you know, I didn't necessarily know how to call them, you know, by name, especially, you know, at four and five years old, you know, I just knew that they were our dogs and you know, they pretty much did what my people said. And so, you know, I wanted to, you know, train dogs to do the same thing. Um, so that's, that's really where it started was, was that, that, that farm life. Um, and then, you know, my, my, my mom and my grandmother at the time kind of fueled that. And some of my cousins and uncles that were also in the area, you know, they were, they were fueling the same thing, you know, they bring their dogs over. So I'd be out in the backyard, you know, playing around with their dogs. And then I remember, uh, my neighbor had a poodle, um, first dog I ever got bitten by. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm used to friendly dogs, you know what I mean? So I'm, you know, not thinking I run up on the dog and the dog bites the shit out of me. And so luckily for me, that didn't, you know, push me away from dogs or animals, you know, at any time, because I'd already been having a good experience, but I was looking at that dog like it was the devil. Like, why would you do that? Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, right. this is crazy. You just bit me for no reason. Mm. So yeah, that's, that's where it started. Um, and then when I got into my teens, well, I actually had a Cocker Spaniel when I was about, my grandmother got me when I was about, I'd say 10 or 11. And I hated that dog. I loved that dog at first, but then I hated that dog because that dog loved my aunt and I hated my aunt and it was my, it was supposed to be my dog. And, uh, I did everything I could until she got that dog out of the house. I mean, that dog would sleep under on my bottom bunk bed and I'd sleep on the top. But he'd never like me. He'd just sleep in my room. Um, but he'd be with my aunt all day long. Name was Tracer. I'll never forget that dog. All black Cocker Spaniel. I wanted a Cocker Spaniel so bad, man. And then I finally got one, and it didn't even like me. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. like, yeah, you got to go. You know, I, I made every excuse I could. I don't have enough time, homework. I'm not getting enough sleep. I think I might be allergic. And the funny thing about it, what you know what got the dog out of the house was... He was allergic to grass. A go figure having a dog being allergic to grass. Mm. So, <laughs> so that's what got the dog out the house um, permanently. Because we take him out for a walk or to let him go out, <clears throat> and he and he basically come back in with like acne, like look like acne on his stomach. Stomach, you know, where the where the skin was exposed. You know, that area on the dog where the skin is exposed. Right. Um, Little, you know, like pus filled bumps every time he'd go out. So, you know, my aunt got sick of taking him to the vet and things like that. So, you know, she's like, all right, I'm going to get rid of him. I got this guy who's going to come and get him. And he said he can do it. And, you know, me, I'm like, I don't care. I'm just like, yes. Right. Fuck you, Tracer. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yes. So I didn't have any more dogs for a while um, until my 16th <gasps> birthday. Um, I, I, I got my first American pit bull terrier. But in between then, I was introduced. My brother had American pit bull terriers. He had German shepherds. One of my brothers, he had uh, Jack Russell terriers. And he was a hell of a dog trainer. And when I used to go visit them in the summer, their neighbor also bred Bordeaux. I, you know, I had never seen a Bordeaux before in my life. And they had six of them just running around in their yard at any given time. And... We didn't really get along with them and they didn't get along with us. And obviously, you know, I wanted to, you know, pet these dogs and interact with them, but I couldn't because of that relationship between, you know, my household and their household. So I just had to watch the dogs from a distance. 
but my brother was bringing in all kind of pit bulls, um, you know, dogs that they would, they, you know, they would get out of the trading post or the news, you know, back, back in the day, man, you know, you're either, if you got money, you know, you're looking in dog fancy dog world magazine. If you don't got money, you're looking in your newspaper or your trading post, or, you know, you're just riding around and you might see signs, puppies for sale, you know, and you stop and see what they got type of deal, you know? Um, so, you know, I, I, I come from that era, um, you know, when you really had to do the legwork to get stuff. Sure. But I didn't I didn't get another dog of my own until my sixteenth birthday and he was a uh he was a Niggerino dog. He had a great pedigree. His name was Hoss. Uh I got him from some guys. They called themselves the Hill Jacks. Uh up in Ohio one summer I was up there and uh biggest pit bull I've ever owned. Uh he was seventy five pound, uh two time champion weight puller, uh great dog. Um wasn't game at first, but at some point in his life, he did become game uh, with me. And then when I would go on to trade him and make a stupid trade for dogs that probably weren't even what they said. Um, but I was introduced through the press of Canary. I, I sent you that picture of that, that dog from uh, the dog encyclopedia, that blue brindle, mm. uh, or Baco, which was owned by Mac Harris. Um, and that, that, mag is, that book was like 1992, 1993, if I'm not mistaken. So it was canary dog. I had never heard of a Presa Canario, Pedro de Presa Canario. The term, the physical term Dogo Canario didn't exist then. So I saw this dog, you know, just looking through the magazines and my brother still to this day, but then you know, it was all about the pit bull and the Amstead, but mainly the American pit bull terrier. So that's all he talked about. So, you know, then, you know, me, monkey see, monkey do, this is my older brother. You know, I want, I want to do what he's doing. So, but that dog, never left my head that canary dog never left my head um you know i saw that picture and immediately i'm like i want to own a dog that looks exactly like this or i want to make a dog that looks exactly like this and Mm. you know it never to this day that image and that thought has never left my head um so like i said I, i got a i got a i got a very nice pit bull on my 16th birthday and I had him for about a year. And at that time, my brother also had a dog named Rage. Uh, she was uh, um, she was a Corvino dog, and she had some Leitner on her pedigree. Uh, a few other dogs I can't recall, but some some dogs that you would know if I said the names that would be in like the Stratton books and things like that. He he pulled her out of a kennel in Indiana, but it wasn't Iron Line or anybody like that. I don't remember the name of the kennel. Um, but she was a short, you know, she was, she was, she was, this dog was probably full grown, maybe 35 pounds, no more than 40 pounds. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we had plans to breed her with my, with my male, but you know, due to unfortunate circumstances, my brother would end up go to prison for a few years. And then the dog got taken by a family member and, you know, he would end up, you know, matching the dog and the dog died. So, you know, waste of a great dog. So, in between that time, I got really heavy um, into the dogs, man. I think at one point in time, and I probably had probably eight or nine pit bulls in the backyard, you know, some papered, some not papered. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had, I had traded Hoss for a guy who said that he had some Corvino dogs, and I was just obsessed with Corvino dogs. And I'm not even sure if it was the actual dog or the name <laughs> that I was obsessed with. Um, you know, but now when I really think about it, um, because the name sounded cool, Corvino. So, you know, this guy, I called him up because he said he had some puppies for sale, and I told him what I had, and I really wasn't trying to trade Hoss or sell Hoss or anything like that. And he said, man, I, I'll give you these two Corvino dogs that I just got from Chicago, and his dude was probably lying here, and most likely he was. Right. Um, and I didn't know him better. My dog had paper. You know, he, you know, he was proven, um, you know, and he was a great dog. So I, my cousin, we drove up there. We met him. Uh, he pulls the pups out, and it was nighttime, so I really wasn't able to get a great look at them, but they looked healthy, you know, they didn't smell bad, you know, nothing nothing that would sway me from getting them, um, you know what I mean, like, uh, the, the eyes were clear, you know, their anus was clean, you know, nothing bad about the dogs, but I just, I know for a fact they were not Corvino dogs, um, so, but I made the swap, <laughs> I made the swap, and, uh, I went back and I told one of my cousins and then he was like, man, you're dumb. <laughs> you know what mm. I mean? He's like, you were dumb, man. You traded Hoss for these dogs. 
And upon getting back and looking at him in the light, man, one of those dogs was like, like that, you know, they, they call it a lilac now. And this was in the 90s, man. Right. It has like that that lilac color mm. to the coat of what they call a lilac. And it had like really bright, like, I don't even know how to describe the eyes, but I had never seen that on American Pitbull Terrier before. You know, I'm not saying that I owned a ton of dogs, but I had read all the books. My brother had dogs. I had dogs. I knew other people that had dogs. And I never saw that. Um, so now I was getting kind of skeptical. So, you know, I gave the guy a call back. And I was like, man, are you sure these Corvino dogs? He's like, yeah, man, I got them straight from Chicago. And I'm like, you know, we have no paperwork on So I already made the trade. So it's not like he's going to give me my dog back. And, you know, in the midst of that conversation, he's like, man, and that dog you gave me, took out my biggest male last night. And I'm like, wow, you mentioned the dog already. Okay, well. Um, so I felt very stupid and I felt played, but I was I was a teenager, you know what I mean? I didn't know any better. I wish I did. So um, from there, I ended up with the Connie Corso. Um, and I kept that dog a secret as long as I could. I didn't want anybody to know that I had it because at this time I had been kicked out of my house in D.C., uh, and I had to go stay with my grandmother uh, in Ohio. And I, I found the dog by accident in a paper, and it was off of Scandifio lines, directly off of uh, Tony Scandifio lines. I didn't get it directly from him, but the guy who had the the parents got them directly from Tony. Mm. And so I went over there. Um, you know, he had a solid blue boy with a well, yeah, he had a little bit of white on the chest. And I used to have pictures of that dog somewhere, but I, I can't find him. Um, so I bought the dog for $500 the dog had papers, you know, the ICCF papers. And, you know, I was super excited because this is the dog that I had seen in the dog world annual magazine, that annual one that would come out a year. And I would stare at that, that magazine. I'd read it every day. Like the dogs were going to jump out of the paper and I would call those guys, uh, who would be in there. And I just sit and talk to them for hours about the Corso, the Pressa, the Neapolitan, the French bulldog and any money I got, I dedicated to, to getting their VHS tapes. So I had stuff from, from Curto's yard. I had stuff from uh, Showstoppers. I had stuff from, you know, all different kinds of kennels. You know, all, people would come to my house just to watch these 30, 40 minute videos that I paid for. Um, and, you know, that's when I really knew, like, well, I already knew I wanted to do something with animals, but that's when I was really like, you know, I don't want to do anything <laughs> else except for animals. Right. Um, so I, I just kept on that path, man. And I was selling reptiles at the same time. I'd been selling reptiles since I was 14. Um, so I was always doing that. Um, and yeah, so I had a Connie, man, and I was I was happy with the dog. And I remember a guy came over to drop me off some bud, man. And my sister opened the door and the dog ran out. Like, I mind you, I said, I didn't want anybody to know I had the dog. So he saw the dog and he's like, man, it was it was like, it wasn't, dark dark outside but it was just enough light where he could see that the dog was a little bit different than what he was used to saying he was like first he was like what is that you got, you got a blue lab i didn't know labs came in blue and i'm like no nah, it's not a lab man and i really was not you know really not trying like man just give me my weed and get the fuck out of here <laughs> like that's right. how, that was my attitude so he's like no that's not a lab he's like, that dog don't have no tail he's like man what kind of dog is that and so i told him and mind you, I'm in a tiny, I don't know, I'm not a tiny town, but a small city. And everybody knows everybody there. And I'm new there. I'm straight out of, you know, D.C. I'm used to the big city life and whatnot. And, uh, man, Eric, within 48 hours, guys who I had never, who had seen me at the school, had never talked to me, were just be walking down my street and knocking on the door asking about this blue dog because no one had ever seen a blue dog before. <clears throat> right. Um so everybody wanted to see this dog, and I really wasn't trying to show anybody. Man, it got to the point, man, I had guys jumping in the backyard. And I still had pit bulls at this time, too, jumping in the backyard trying to steal my dogs. Like my grandmother would be out there chasing them off either with a loaded forty five or a shovel. Because this is her house, and she's an old native woman, and she don't play that shit. Right. So, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I uh, told a couple buddies of mine that I was kind of close with, and then they went to the same guy and they ended up getting uh, two of my dog's brothers. The dog's name was Bane. That was the year that Batman broke Bane's back. I don't know if you remember that in the comic book. That was like 98, mm. 99. Um, so I named him Bane because I wasn't really a big fan of Batman. So I was like, Bane, we're going to name him Bane. 
And everybody loved that dog. You know, I went up, got his ears cut, you know, everything. He's a beautiful dog, man. And, I, you know, and I, I took that dog everywhere with me. And mm-hmm. so my homies went and got some. And uh, funny because I ended up with their dogs in my yard. Uh, you know, I said, man, I, I ain't got time for him or such and such and such. Or he's not looking like your dog. Like, what are you feeding your dog? And I was doing raw diet back then because that's what I had always been told, that, you know, you use dry food as a supplement. So that's how I've always fed my dogs. Um, so they were, you know, and they saw a huge difference. And I, and I will say this, I'm not going to say that they didn't have dogs in this town, but when I got there, Eric, they had to step their game up for sure. Right. Because I, you know, I wasn't, I, if I, if it wasn't what I needed it to be, I wasn't going to spend money on it. You know, I got duped one time, you know, swapping halls for those two dogs and they weren't bad dogs. They just weren't what I was told they were, you know, so, you know, these guys were, they really had to step their game up. And, and, you know, people had pit bulls then. No one had ever really heard of Oppressa. And, you know, then people wanted to get Connie Corso. And I remember taking a trip to Tennessee. I don't remember the name of the kennel, but I do remember the breeders. Names were Bud and Lois Williams in Tennessee. And a friend of mine, we drove down there. There was five of us. We almost died on the way down there. We almost ran into a medium. Lucky, like, I was awake to grab the steering wheel. But we get down there, and he bought three Connie Corsos. But, you know, back then, you know, they were calling them Cane Corsos. And even though I kept saying Connie Corso, everyone else kept saying Cane Corso. I'm like, there's no dog called a Cane Corso. It's Connie Corso. But I got sick of, you know, arguing with these guys about the name of the dog. But he got these three dogs, and... Then I started to notice something like all these Corso breeders either had Neos and Rottweilers or just Rotties and Neos. And then, it, you know, I know we're not here to talk about the Corso, so I won't jump into that. But I started putting things together. And then as I started talking to other breeders, <clears throat> Pressa and Corso, I started getting, you know, a whole different set of information. Now, fast forward to now I get my first Corso. I'm not, sorry, my first Pressa Canario. Um, I was a freshman in college, um, 18 at the time, you know, fresh out of high school. Um, the dog came from what I would consider now to be a puppy mill, man, you know, but he was the only guy that had him. It was the only thing that was in my price range. So, you know, my aunt, I went, I moved back to DC at this time to go to college. And, uh, my aunt drove me out to upper Marlboro to see this guy, man, Eric, when I tell you, he had every Mastiff breed you can think of. Neos, Corsos, Pressas, Amstaffs, you know, American Pitbull Terriers, Band Dogs. Like, everything you could think of, he had it. And it was just him and a little Filipino lady that helped him do everything. Mm. And so, I, you know, took me back to see all the Pressas. He had, he had at least 20 Pressa Canarios there, you know, and they all had a different look to them. You know, and, but none of them really looked like Arbaco the dog that I could never get out of my mind. But by that time, I had been seeing other dogs. You know, I had been seeing Richard Kelly, Bill Thiefault, Tall Oaks, and a whole, uh, uh, Dan Wilson up in, at Balkan Kennels, who no longer breeds anymore, uh, up in Canada. So I had seen all these dogs, and I had talked to all these people extensively. Um, and then even Richard Kelly had done a thing, FX used to do like a thing every Saturday or Sunday where they featured a different animal. And the Press of Canario was on there one time. Uh, I didn't even know that that was going to happen. I just would watch the show because it was an animal show. And sure enough, I turned it on one day, and there's Richard Kelly with Medusa. Um, and I think I sent you a picture of Medusa. She's that brindle, like that grayish brindle dog that's got a ton of white on her. Mm-hmm. Um, and they have the signs behind her. So I know when you, whenever you do your, your, your slide, they'll see it. But people know. They know that dog. Um, she definitely didn't fit the standards of a Press of Canario. Um, but at that point in time, I was just familiarizing myself with what the standards were um, because the standard that I saw in the dog encyclopedia would not go on to be the standard that, that they would use, and then it would change again. <coughs> so at that time, like I said, I just wanted a Pressa. So I got a Pressa. Uh, I get back home. <laughs> Man, that dog was crazy, but I loved it. But he didn't like anybody that wasn't me or my aunt. And I hated the fact that he liked my aunt. <laughs> so I'm like, if you're going to bite somebody, bite her ass. Like, damn it. Mm-hmm. But I remember my homie, my homie came over. He tried to pet him. The second he reached down to try to pet him, he snapped at him immediately. And we're talking a three-and-a-half, four-month-old puppy. 
like immediately, no hesitation. And when I saw that, I was like, oh, hell yeah. You know, I'm going to I'm gonna expand on this. I'm going to get this dog. It's going to be the best trained dog I've ever had. And I'm going to get another one. Um, and the dog ended up getting Parvo, even though it had already been vaccinated for Parvo, which was very strange to me. Mm. Um, but I also had, a, I had another incident because I took that dog to get his ears cut. And the vet was literally across the street from our house. And... Eric, to this day, I don't know how this happened. I've never seen this happen. The vet cut my dog's ears upside down, if that makes sense. So you normally, the, when you cut a dog's ears, the point goes up. The mm -hmm. point on my dog's ears were at the bottom. I don't know, look, that sounds crazy. I don't know how he did it, but I almost fought this guy. And he really thought I was going to pay him for that. So now you've ruined my dog. Um, and there's no telling, you know, what happened because my dog was fine before he went there ears cut and about within a week you know i was taking that dog to the er and they're like well it's going to cost this much to save it uh and then my aunt's like nah man i don't know because they're saying that it, it, it's uh you know it's like a 50 50 chance so i don't want to spend this much money and then the dog still die she's like i'll just take you to buy another dog so i was like okay all right well let's do that but you know i ain't gonna lie to you when i got back home and i cried Mm -hmm. I went in my room and I closed that door because, you know, this is a dog that I've wanted more than anything. Right. And I and he had been playing with other dogs in the neighborhood as well. But, you know, I'm not thinking anything because there, there was a guy across the street that had a that bred pit bulls. And his dogs were healthy. They were never sick from what I could tell. So I would just assume that, you know, his dogs had been vaccinated as well. And I, I knew my dogs had had. So... I went home and I cried, man. I, you know, and I think my aunt was crying in her room too because she really liked that dog as well. I mean, he he was a well-behaved dog for us. He just did not like other people. Um, you know, so now this is like, you know, I'm like, dude, I, I got to get another Pressa, but I couldn't find any, so I ended up with another Connie Corso. Um, and well, she wasn't a bad dog, but she wasn't what I wanted. Um, and I ended up, I ended up not keeping. I kept her maybe for about two years while I was in college to take her up to the college campus. Usually, she was a chick magnet because you know, they never seen a dog like this before. Right. <laughs> um, so later on, I'm like, you know what? I'm <clears throat> messing with these other dogs, and I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna buy anything else until I can get a, another Pressa. And um, that's when I got introduced to a guy named Tony Robinson. He was doing shuts and work in Upper Marlboro, Maryland, and he had dogs off of Tiger Guard Kennel. Um, an owner of that kennel was Tim Ponsbury, who now breeds band dogs. But he was also, at every point in time, he was always working on his own breed, but he was famous for breeding Bordeaux. But he had Bordeaux, he had Neos, he had Presses. So this is now when I'm getting more information. And it was kind of contradicting what I had been hearing from guys like Richard Kelly and Bill Thiefault, because Bill and Richard and a couple other guys and Tim were all going over to the island at one time. And they would go over there and buy entire litters of Presses, according to what Tim told me, for four and $5,000, the whole litters. And then they would divide the puppies up and, you know, they'd come back over here and divide the puppies up. And, uh... For anybody who is familiar with Tiger Guard Kennel, I had a son of Zeus and a brother to Hercules. Um, monster of a dog, man. Monster of a presser. He, I got him when he was about two and a half years old from Tony's yard. Tony had bred him a couple times, uh, and I actually got to see one of his daughters. So, you know, I, I actually got to see what he was producing as well. I can tell you now that I, he, called, he was calling the dog Papa Doc, and I renamed him Bardock. Uh, Dragon Ball Z character because I just didn't like the name Papa Doc. Um, but this dog was at least, at least 150, 160 pounds, at least. And when he stood up, I remember he jumped up on my neighbor's shoulders one time and my neighbor was like 6'3", and the dog's head was over his head. I mean, that's just how long this dog was. Yeah. For, and for a male, you don't always get that length. But when you do, you know, it's a hell of a thing. But... I walk him down. Dude, this dog almost caused accidents. You know, walking him down South Capitol Street in D.C., guys pulling over, like just you know, Skr! dude, what the hell kind of pit bull is that? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, right. I've never seen a pit bull that big. You know, I'm like, well, first of all, it's not a pit bull. Uh, it's a Presa Canario. They're like a what a what? <laughs> it's like man, it's a it's a, a Spanish 
canary dog. And they're just like, I don't even know what the hell that is, but I'd like to get one. Or guys would think he was a bull mastiff because his ears weren't cut. And, yeah, he was a good dog, man. He was a really, really good dog. And due to some baby mama drama at the time, <laughs> um, you know, I, I ended up losing the dog, uh, oh, unfortunately. Man. Yeah, I, so I, I was very bummed about that, man, because I, I had plans on breeding him with another dog that Tony had. You know, I was setting all this stuff up. Um, you know, I was going to the shows. I remember uh, before I even had that dog, the 2001 Arba Classic, I still had Connie Corso. I actually ran into Richard Kelly in person there. Uh, not Bill Feifel. Bill wasn't there, but Tall Oaks Kennel was there. I can I can never remember the, the guy who, the people who owned Tall Oaks Kennel, their name. But Tony Scandifio was there. And just to kind of backtrack a little bit, this is when I found out a little bit about the Corso that I had. Because I stopped Tony and I was like, hey, man, I got this dog and your name is on the papers. And he said, hey, I don't really have time to talk, but what's your question? I got to get to the next circuit. And he said, I said, well, I bought this dog from this guy named Mike. And he said, Mike, such and such in, in Ohio? And I said, yeah. He said, really? I said, yeah. And I showed him a picture. And he said, man. He said, he wasn't even supposed to be breeding those dogs. Those dogs. And he's like, I don't even know how he did that. Um, so... Yeah, that, that was, you know, I'm like, wow. So I got a dog, because Tony was like, dude, that he's like, right now, it's not solid. And they're still throwing, he's like, I'm still getting dogs that are throwing like black and tan and things that are less desirable, those Rottweiler patterns, and things like that. Um, so, yeah, just, just, I just, I, I just thought about that. But yeah, so I, I lost, I lost Bardock, man, and I was, I was extremely upset. Um, and I, and I kind of just went back into reptiles, man. I ain't gonna mess with no more dogs. Right. I forget this. I'm just gonna mess with these snakes, and that's what I did for a long time. And every and every now and then, I I I grab a pit bull for a few years or something like that. And you know, but it was just it just never it just wasn't a presser. You yeah. know what I mean? It just wasn't what I wanted. Like in in any way, shape, or form. And I'm not. I love American pit bull terriers. So I don't want anybody to think that I'm knocking that breed because I'm not. No, that's one of my favorite breeds. But it it just wasn't doing it for me. Right. So. Um, so in the midst of that, man, I started doing a lot of research on this dog and I'm like, man, I want to go over there. I want to see these dogs in person. I don't know when I'm going to do it. I don't know how I'm going to do it because I'm also in college at the time. So, um, you know, I was just doing research, 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 talking to everybody that I could. I remember a story that, uh, Bill Feifold told me from guardian angel kennels. He said that he had to stop breeding, uh, solid brindle American bulldogs because the guys in the Canary Islands were buying his dogs and breeding them with their canary dogs to make the heads bigger. Mm. Well, that prompted me to do even more research because, mind you, I told you I had some old videotapes from the 90s back there from Curto's Yard and other, and other kennels that, were, that weren't even named in the video. And some of that stuff that I, that I sent to you from, the, what, from 94 to 97 – I'm like, well, that doesn't really make sense. Why would, I guess, unless that kennel was specifically trying to breed, you know, solid colored dogs, but there were dogs over there that were blue. There were dogs over there that were piebald. There were dogs, you know, there were, there, there were presses over there that were coming in every, every color that you can think of. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, like, you know, and, and you, you know, I know people would like to try to deny that, but, I should, you know, Eric, you know me, man. I ain't going to show you nothing or talk to you about nothing that you can't go and look up yourself. And you saw those videos that I sent you. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. So it, it's it's undeniable. So and I think that's what the big controversy about Arbaco being a blue brindle dog was because that you haven't seen that many of them. Even in even in those videos, you only saw two. But there was Arbaco, and then Fred, who I have a dog from Fred's kennel here. Fred threw a, a random litter of blue brindle dogs, and I have a picture of one of the puppies. Um, and I talked to Fred about that, and he said, "Man, you know when you're." Dylan in, you know, black and black, breeding black to black, anything can happen. It's, you know, all colors come from that. He said, well, it's not something that we did on purpose. It just happened. But Fred has also got a dog that is like 95% white. You know what I mean? And she's throwing all, all kind of color pups down there. But those were the same kind of dogs that you would see in the video. And those were the same dogs that I saw when I went over there. So it didn't make sense on... Some of the information that I was getting, I'm like, are they lying? Are they just, did they just not know? You know, like, 
So I'm, that's why I was like, dude, I just, gotta, I just gotta do this research myself. Most of the books back then were in Spanish, and then a book did finally come out that was in English, and in my opinion, the book was kind of contradicting what I had been told by Richard Kelly and other people. You know, they said that the dog went extinct in 1975, but then you have these guys saying that they found pure specimens of the dog, and I'm like, well, if the dog went extinct, like, did it go extinct or did it not go extinct? You know, I, I, I'm not sure. So I'm like, I can't, I, I gotta hear this shit from the horse's mouth. So I would, I would call over to the Canary Eyes, I would get, I would get international calling cards, and I would call over there, and in my, in my mind the whole time, I'm like, I gotta get over here, I gotta get over there, I gotta get over there, I gotta get over there. But I'm talking to them, and what they explained to me was, as long as the dog is at least 50% Bardino, then it's oppressive, as far as we're concerned. That's what they told me. Um, so eventually, I did get to go over to the island, and... Like I was saying before, I saw the same things that I was showing you in those videos. And it wasn't, it wasn't what they were telling me over here. So then I started losing a lot of trust in the breeders over here and what they were actually doing and where the dogs were actually coming from because I didn't know anything about dogs coming from Spain at the time. And then I got introduced to, not personally introduced to, but introduced to the name Juan Carlos. And so they were saying, you know, Juan Carlos dogs, Juan Carlos dogs. And, and now you got Curto dogs, and then you have other people who also had canary dogs in different parts of both of those islands, you know, and, and, and they were all doing different things. Some, some were using the Bull Terrier, some were using Neos, some were using Great Danes, some were using Amstaffs, you know, some were using Felas. Like, I, I had, I've got two males here. I had two males here, two brothers, same litters, not line bred, both parents, both parents the same, and... I remember I sent a picture to my brother, and he was like, you bought a Pressa and a Fila? I said, nah, man, they're brothers. I said, but yeah, this one does. I said, well, you know, they use, some lines have Fila in them, and some lines have this in them, and some lines have this. Now, I had been reading this book that was in English, and the way, I guess it wasn't, being, it wasn't depicting clearly what had happened, you know, as far as creating it, but it was saying that they used 20-plus dogs to recreate the Presa Canario. So I guess in my mind, I took that as all of these dogs at one time in, in a specific order were going into the Bardino. Mm. But that's not what was happening. What was happening was of those 20 dogs, someone might use three, some of them might only use one, some of them might use two, somebody might use 10, and that's how they were doing them. And so now you're starting to see different styles. Man, if you, even if you go through Kurto's book, man, some of the dogs that they were crossing to make presses look like large Jack Russell Terriers. And I'm talking like maybe a 40-pound Jack Russell. You would never think that this dog had any kind of relation to a press at Canary. He had a dog named Peba. It's in the book. And she looks like a, she looks like a mutt, a straight mutt like, that you would see running around New York City somewhere. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, like, there ain't no fucking way. This dog throwing puppies like that? Like, hell no. Nah. Mm -hmm. But she was, or at least according to what they were saying. Now, in the midst of this, I guess the separation came in, and they wanted to do a name change because of the standard change. And so now it's Presa Canario versus Dogo Canario. And I'm going to say this on record, and I've said this before on my channel. The Dogo Canario and the Presa Canario is no more different than the Amstaff and the American Pitbull Terrier. In, 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 in my opinion, like I've, I've, I've seen a couple that are that with these straight backs and standard doesn't call for that. So I don't know what's up with that, but I know people that call their dogs Dogo Canario and I know people that call their dogs Preston Canario and they're under and they may be out of the same litter. You know, they just went to different people. So mm -hmm. then that kind of is like, that's kind of like with the Connie de Pressa and the Neapolitan and the Sicilian Mastiff. Um, you know, where they're being called a different name because of the region. So I was like, so is that, is that what's going to happen with the Presa Canario? Um, but, you know, at that time, a lot, like I said, a lot of dogs were coming over here and they really weren't fitting any of the standards. Like Medusa was like almost 29 inches tall. She had way more than 20% white on her coat. Um, you know, and that's not what the standard called for. Me, I'm stuck on the 84 to 106 pound standard calling for the dog to be no more than 25, 25 and a half inches, 26 at best. That's 
that's what I'm working with now. You know, like that's what I like, and that's and I and it took a long time to source to source those dogs. Mm-hmm. So I got to the point like I was starting to get very fed up, and I know a, a lot of other guys too were because I guess you know my people might get mad at me for saying this, but this country ruins a lot of breeds. Um, you know, for I don't know if it's for ego or monetary gain or a little bit of both or I don't know what it is, but the press of Canario was I saw was definitely going down that path. It was never a extremely popular dog. And then when that what was that dog Bane? Was it Bane and Delilah? I don't remember the female's name, but Bane and the other female dog ripped the lady apart. Um, you know, in her apartment building. And then you know that wasn't already a good look. And then you had a lady werewolf kennels in Canada who wanted to take credit for those dogs, even though she didn't breed them. And there was a funny thing about werewolf kennels is she didn't even have press of canarios. She was making Canadian prey dogs. And I'm not going to knock what she was doing, but she was calling them pedo de press of canarios, and they were not. She had blue dogs up there. She had fawn dogs. She had brindle dogs. She had piebald dogs. And they all, she had some that looked like Neos. I mean, she had one dog that looked like Remy from the Remy line, mm-hmm. uh, American Bully. Uh, named named Lady Frankenstein. I'm never and, and it was a great looking dog. That's why I said like but the thing about her was <clears throat> she wanna sell you a dog for four or five thousand dollars and then she doesn't even want to give you the papers. Um which is crazy because a lot of that's going on. I I've been stiffed on papers twice, uh, recently. But um yeah, so the the pit, the, 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 the press and now is starting to get a bad rap. So uh, a lot of people were starting to stray away from it, or now they don't want to sell to the public. And that's around the time Vulcan Kennels, Dan, he just disappeared. You know, I don't know what happened to him to this day, but he was a guy that I enjoyed talking to. But at that time, they kept it real with you about the Pressa, because the Pressa was a different dog then than it is now for the most part. Um, and I say that saying that that dog would kill you or attack you even if you were the owner, and it happened. So you can't deny that because that dog had an attitude, a nasty attitude. And the older you got them and they didn't know you, the harder it was to deal with. I I had dogs I couldn't even get out the crate for like two days and she just chewed herself out of the crate. You know, I come outside Mm. and she's just in the backyard. And I'm like, fuck, (laughs) let me creep back in here and go get a baseball bat or something because (laughs) like, you know, this bitch is looking like she wants to do something. And, you know, but, you know, you, you work with them uh, and you put them in situations where they have to trust you and, and you hope that it works out for the best. And, and I was fortunate enough that I've never, you know, I've never had, well, I know I can't say that I haven't had an encounter because uh, uh, Beerus, my, 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 my male Champa, his brother, actually did try to bite me a number of times the day that I got him here, which they were, I got them a week apart. But that's another story. Uh, but the presser was extremely aggressive. Um, you know, it didn't care. It didn't quit. It was, the dogs were bigger. I I believe that they had more substance, the bone. I mean, they were, to me at that point in time, they were just all around better dogs and stuff that I'm seeing now, like, you know, frontline dogs and things like that, where these dogs are getting smaller, but they're, they're losing, they're losing bone. Um, you know, I haven't, I've, I've only heard stories and I've talked to this guy a couple of times and I just, you know, I just don't like what he spit at me and a lot of these other kennels, but the dog is definitely different. The attitude has changed for mm-hmm. sure because, you know, back then most, a good breeder was going to tell you, this ain't the dog for you. You don't want this dog. Like right. this dog is liable to do this, 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 and that. And if you can't make the executive decisions in the house, the press of Canario will make the executive decisions for you. Like, man, he will come home and want to check your paycheck. Like, dude, I thought you said you worked 40 hours. This is only 37 on this check. Where were you for, where were you for three hours? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, because that was the attitude they had. It was like, if you're not going to run the show, I'm going to run the show. And, and once that happens, you try and challenge a 150-pound dog. You're going to have to put a bullet in that thing. Right. You're not going to wrestle with that. You're not going to wrestle with that dog. Even if you win, man, you're 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 going to go to the hospital for sure. You're 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 going to you're going to be you're you're going to be messed up. So that that gave the dog a bad reputation, and I think to date it's like 111 press the canario attacks. I think maybe worldwide. I don't think it's just in the United States. I think that I think that number is worldwide. 
Mm. And now, and now it's got them rated as one of the top five most dangerous breeds in the world. Um, but I've seen that the dogs are being watered down. Now, a lot of guys feel the same way that I do. So from that, a lot of people are now importing dogs, like uh, from Milky Way. And he's got some monster dogs there. Um, and other kennels in Romania and Poland. Well, Ewa lives here now, so I guess nobody... Well, I'm sure there are other kennels in Poland. But even Ewa's dogs have flipped from... When I used to see her dogs from Ray Gladiator, I mean... I. Those dogs kind of remind. She kind of reminded me of the stuff that Juan Carlos had. Even Curto's dogs have flipped. They're not. He used to have the same style of dogs that Juan Carlos had, and he does not anymore. You know, Juan Carlos hasn't bred in, in a long time. There's, there's very little information about him or his dog. But I think Iwa did interview him. Um, you know, for people who know Ray Gladiator and who know Iwa. But now you got a lot of speculation about all of these kennels, and even if their dogs are actually true Petro de Presa Canarios. Mm. Um, you know, I hear things all the time about people's kennels. Oh, those dogs are mixed with Dogo, or they're mixed with this, or they got bull masks in them, you know, all this other stuff. So now everyone's DNA testing everything. Um, you know, just because now nobody knows and everybody wants to have, you know, a 100% Pressa. So now the rule is if it's 80%, then it's a Presa Canario. Well, in my opinion, if it's not 100%, then it's not a Presa Canario. Um, you know, I got a dog here that's questionable that I'm going to get a DNA test on because this dog acts more like a pit bull than anything. But I know she's, if, if she's not 100%, I know she's got some in her, but before I do anything with her physically, you know, she will get a DNA test um, because I do plan on making my own breed, but I didn't plan on doing it anytime soon. Mm -hmm. So... Um, but you know, I, I, I've got a pretty good reputation in the animal world, reptile and dog. So the last thing I want to do is sell somebody something that it's not, whether I did it on purpose or whether I really didn't know because I just didn't take the time to DNA test my dogs. I mean, you got guys there and they want to pin hit their dog and things like that. So, um, which is kind of no excuse because insurance covers a lot of that stuff. So if you do have dog insurance and you don't want to pay your bills, you can, you can use most of it. And I know my insurance covers pin hit. So, but yeah, the dogs have definitely flipped. Um, but like I said, they've gotten smaller. I don't see as much bone on, on some of these, some of these newer generations of dogs. And then when I see dogs in Romania and things like that, I mean, these dogs are huge, you know, like man, Milky Way's got this dog. I, I think I might've sent you a picture of him walking that, that clear brindle dog. I mean, that dog was like not even a year old and had to be at least 150, 160 pounds. I'm like, it can't get any bigger than that, can it? You know, but I, you know, no telling, dude. That thing's a beast. Um, but through my research, man, I can also tell you that the more I thought that I was maybe not getting the full truth, I started seeing presses or, or dogs that were used to cross presses or were said to be Bardinos that kind of looked like Kangles and things like that. And so I'm like, dude, what, what is you know, what is really going on here? And I think a lot of people were feeling the same way I was. And I know a lot of Pressa guys dropped the Pressa and went to the Borable. Or they went to the American Bully. You know, a lot of guys went to the American Bully. Right. Um, but I, I think a lot of guys went to that just for monetary gain because, you know, that dog has made homeless people into damn near millionaires. Right. Like, how the hell, how the hell do you even afford this dog? You were homeless yesterday. Now you got a $10,000 stud fee. So, right. but you know, that, that's what's happening right now. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a totally different dog and I wasn't satisfied with what I was seeing. So I hit up, you know, just some, some guys that I knew and these guys aren't, they're, they're not breeders like that. They're not showers. They just happen to keep old school stuff that I was looking for, you know, and I hit them up and I had a good rep with them. I had done stuff for them before. Maybe it was genetics charts or got their kid a reptile. So they looked out for me on the price and, to let me get these dogs, these great dogs that I wanted. And, you know, so now I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to really start doing my thing again, you know, with the Pressa because, you know, I dealt with reptiles for the longest and I just, you know, kind of like all, not all the way, but I'm like 90% stepped away from that. I'm just kind of doing things behind the scene as far as the reptile game is concerned. So now I'm like truly focusing on the Pressa and, you know, showing people a lot of stuff that I would never show people before, like how I, how I've been doing my raw diets for a very long time and why I do my raw diets this way and how it affects, you know, my dogs, not, you know, not only their, their look, but their immune system and everything else, because all that shit is important. Um, and the Pressa, in my opinion, is a standalone breed, and I want to make sure I do right by it. I mean, you've got a dog that 
in so many ways resembles like a big cat. I mean, it's cat footed. It's got a it's got a high back like that old Lexus GS three hundred. You know, I used to love that car, and I used to always compare that car to a Pressa. Um, you know, just the way they move is just so it's so. Elegant. I've even had my neighbors of like, man, when your lights are on at night, it looks like you got pumas walking around in your house with their tails up, and it's like, man, it's just crazy to look over and see them <laughs> it's like mm. walking through the curtains and things like that. And I'm like, yeah, man, I love them. I love these dogs, man. And everyone here knows, you know, I live in a tiny, tiny mountain town. Everybody knows these dogs. Oh, my God, your dogs are so well-behaved. They're so beautiful. You know, like, what kind are they? I want one. You know, this, this that, and the other. But they're a very majestic breed. Um, and, and, I, and I have a hard time even comparing another dog to the Pressa. And I think the only thing that I could even put close to it may be a Fila. You know, mm-hmm. I see all these videos online, and they talk about, <clears throat> comparing the Connie Corso to the Pressa, man, there ain't no fucking comparison, you know, Connie Corso to a Pressa. I'm only cool with a couple Corso breeders that do have really nice dogs. It's not a breed that, that that's for me. I don't like leggy dogs, but you know, there's no comparison. And, you know, but you know, I guess YouTube, you know, everybody, you know, you're looking for views and whatnot, you know, shit like that kind of pisses people off when they see it. But there's so many, the press are compared to this, the press are compared to that, compared to this, that, and the other. And a lot of those videos are biased. Like the Connie Corso always wins, no matter what dog, you know what I mean? It's right. clear what dog you own. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so right. shit like that, man. That's why I tell people like, you, you don't, don't go off social media. Don't buy dogs based off what you see in videos. Don't buy dogs based off you see somebody walking them down the street. Like, you know, go to a kennel, spend some time on the phone, put in the legwork like we used to have to do back in the day, um, you know, to get what you really, really want. Because you might go to someone's kennel and find out that the Presser Canario really ain't the dog for you. He just looks good. It's just got the look that you want, but the attitude you can't handle. Right. You know, that but yeah, sense. that's, you know, with... I mean, there, there, there's, there's so much that I can say about this dog, especially, you know, the, the, the history of it. They, they talk about dogs on the islands, like coming back into the 15th century that, that, that may or may not have been brought there by settled European settlers and things like that. And they also talk about, you know, large, like ferocious, mastiff dogs, but they couldn't really put a name on them. So people assume they were this breed or they assume they were that breed, but no one really knows. And then, you know, when the Bardino came into play, and just so people who aren't familiar with the breed, the reason why the Pressa is so fiery is not because of the dogs that it was crossed into the Bardino with, but because of the bar. That dog is nuts. That is where the Pressa gets its attitude from. You know, mm-hmm. that, 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 those dogs are, are like a bomb sometimes, man. You know, they, they, they are, they can be ferocious and they, and they look like, they look like something you'd find in the street somewhere. But mm-hmm. that is how we have the Presa Canario from, you know, from, from the Bardino Majoero. I always say it wrong, but Majoero. Um, so you, you definitely had a split. Um, of enthusiasts that went one way and then some people went the other way. It was actually like a three-way split because some people, Pedro de Presa Canario, Dogo Canario, and then some people just left altogether. They just didn't want to deal with it. Right. Now, people are starting to bring back the dog that you would see when they first started recreating the dog. So now you're starting to see kennels <laughs> who want more white in their dog. That's way over the 20% standard. So that means now the standard really doesn't matter anymore because now that's going to become what I'm calling now is like a trending Pressa. Mm-hmm. So people are wanting dogs with more white. Even when I talk to Frank, he's like, yeah, man, I'm not really selling a lot of solid dogs, but the guys that are buying dogs from me, you know, they're buying dogs that got more white on them than anything. So I guess they're trying to bring it back. And I said, well, yeah, there's a, there's a few kennels now that got dogs that are 80, 90% white. Um, I said, so that, that is becoming a new trend. Um, so, you know, now we do have people who are deliberately breeding against the standard, but it's not saying that they don't have Pressa Canario because some people would argue, oh, they're not real Pressas because they got all that white. Well, that's not necessarily true, and anyone who would say that really would not know the true history of the Pressa Canario because there's plenty of videos and photos that prove otherwise, that, that those dogs at one point did have, you know, varied amounts of white, but then they 
determined that this is the standard that they want, so then they won't breed dogs like that anymore. But obviously, it's in the genetics, so it's going to pop up at some point in time. And you know, like I know, when people start breeding for that stuff, then you're going to get it more and more and more and more often. So now that is what you're seeing is the dogs with the more white are becoming the new style of Presa Canario. And I think that's why a lot of people are starting to say that so-and-so is using Dogos and look at their dogs, look how skinny they are, look at their face, that's not a Pressa. I'm not spending any money with them unless they DNA test. And so it's kind of like, it's not helping the breed at all in any way, shape and form, I don't, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Because when you start separating things like that, then that means that the community is going to be separated. And if we can't agree on anything, then you know, that's not going to help the breed. If, right. if you've got people trying to take the same dog and pull it two different ways. Um, you know, so that's something that I'm definitely opposed to. You know, I think we all need to be working together, you know, to keep the breed as pure as possible. But I will say that standards have definitely fucked some dogs up to an extent because some things, you know, unless it's something like extremely physical, where the dog is not going to be able to function or something like that. Right. And yeah, you definitely have to focus on that. But there were presses that had a, a ton of white on them. And does it mean that they're less press a canario than a brindle dog, than a solid brindle dog or a solid bond dog? But that's what people's argument is. Like, oh, nope. And then when the black dog, there were, there were no black dogs. That's what they were saying. But there were black dogs. There were black dogs on the island. Kurt even said there were black dogs. Juan Carlos even stated there were black dogs. There were black dogs. Mm. Um, I can't say what the black dogs are now because even people who know just a little bit about the press were like, well, yeah, we never saw any black. There was only black brindle, and that's very true. For years and years and years, no one ever bought any solid black dogs over here or to Canada or anywhere. But then in the last, like, I would say, uh, and this is just for me seeing it. It could go back a little further, but I would say like 2015, 2016 is when I started seeing the solid black dogs. And mm. so now that's becoming like the blue, quote unquote, American pit bull terrier. Now they want high dollar for this dog. You know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand dollars, and some of these kennels got a four or five year waiting list to get one. Um, but. Curso does he has black dogs on his kennel yard now, but he didn't before. Mm -hmm. um, so every kennel now has got to have a black dog. It's like every, you know, back in the day, everybody, well, not everybody, but some people who would be considered not to be true pit bull enthusiasts had to have a blue dog on their kennel. Because, mm -hmm. you, you know, like I know, there was a separation with that. People yeah. were arguing about that. There's no such thing as a, a blue American pit bull terrier. That's an Amstaff. It's got ruffian blood. I can name dogs on the pedigree. Da, 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 da. So, you know, that was that argument right. there. And now I see the Pressa kind of heading in the same direction because of the black dog. Now, well, I have I mean, seen some black dogs that do resemble Pressas 100%. And then I've seen some black dogs that they don't really look like Pressas to me. It just goes back uh -huh. to what you were saying about community. Um, right. If anything that that's that's of any purity, whether we're talking dogs or anything else, it's it's only pure because of the community behind it. And now I argue that, uh, like you know, there there is two different pit bulls now. You know, whether people like to admit it or not, as long as there's two communities, there's two different pit bulls. You know, I I personally think that one should be just called an Amstaff and left the fuck alone, but obviously that, you know, my word doesn't pull so much weight. <laughs> but I agree with you. Yeah, I mean, it, it might it might as well at the end of the day um, because that's what they resemble more of. But switching lanes real quick, um, I wanted you to dive further into uh, into some of your raw feeding regiments. Okay, um... So here's the thing with me um, when it comes to how I feed uh, my canines. One, everything is done by weight because that's extremely important. So for all the guys who are listening who don't do that, um, if you're not weighting your food out to what your dog actually needs, it doesn't matter what you're putting in there. It doesn't matter the antioxidants. It doesn't matter if you're using greens or blueberries or, or raw meat because 
if, if it's not up to the weight that your dog needs for its, for its body to take on and support all that nutrients and use it, then you're just wasting money and time, and you might as well just feed them dry dog food. Mm. Excuse me. So that, that's really important is the weight. So um, I did a video, and so anybody who wants to go and check it out, you know, go check out my raw video. I've got some of my notes up there um, just so you can see exactly what I do. But it, it, there's when you come to raw diets, there's no excuse to – only feed your dog one way because you have so many meats now you have you know there's so much you can do you have you know you've got so many fruits and vegetables that are good with dogs peas carrots blackberries blueberries strawberries cherries mangoes pineapples beaver meat you know you've got quail chicken duck salmon you've got it all so what i try to do is i i feed my dogs based on what I'm going to be doing with them. It could be for the month, it could be for the week. It might even just be for the day. They might only get a one specific meal that I drew up for the day and I actually sit down and I, you know, I write this shit out. You know, like what I'm gonna do early in the morning before I even put anything in the bowl. And when that meal is, when that raw part is done, I then measure out and then I do whatever the equivalent to dry is as a supplement not as a source of food. It, it's a supplement. That is how I was always taught that dry food is supposed to be used because one, for people who don't know the history of dry dog food, and I've also done a video on this, uh, I can't remember the guy's name off the top of my head, but he's in my, I, I put a picture of him up in one of my videos. Dry food, kibble was like a snack that a guy made just for, to give his dog along the way, and then it became to become manufactured on a large scale, and that's how you have kibble. That's where, that's where it started. Mm -hmm. and, for, and most people know that there was no regulations on making dry dog food. So you're getting roadkill, you're getting whatever the hell it is for, for, some, for some of these larger companies. And you wonder why your dogs are getting cancer, they've got tumors, or you know, it's just not, your dog just ain't looking the way you know, people ask me all the time, and my dear, like, man, dog, your dogs look good, man. What do you, what do you, how do you feed them? What do you this? What do you that? And I, I honestly, <laughs> I, I, I really try to charge people for this info because I know people get paid for some incorrect information. And I'm like, I've given a lot of information away for free, but yeah, I, I, I build my dog's diet to help its immune system, to give it the functionality it needs for the day. Um, also, I don't want to smell dog all day. So raw feeding cuts down on the breath, it cuts down on the tartar, keeps the eyes clear, it keeps the, sco the skin and the coat from getting that, that, that odor that you get when you feed dry dog food. Everybody, we all, all our pores breathe. We all breathe through our skin. You know what I mean? Not just through our nose and through our mouth, and so did dogs. And presses only have one coat, there's no undercoat. So. You know, if you're feeding them that trash all day, man, they're gonna they're gonna get a smell. And then if you're keeping them outside, things like that, it's just it's just not a good look for them. And they appreciate being fed, you know, liver and things like that. Like that's the stuff that they need. The organ meat, like that stuff is good. Chicken liver, beef liver, fish liver, turkey liver, quail. Give them whole prey. Give them quail. Give them a whole rabbit. Like they need all of that. You can't just take a bowl of dry and put a chicken leg on it like I saw a guy do and he claimed that you know the reason his YouTube channel blew up was because of what he just what I just literally what I just described he put a chicken leg in like a like four cups of dry and a chicken leg and he's like yeah this is my raw diet I'm like oh my god like you got how many views on this <laughs> wow <laughs> you know and but people were listening to him and he's like yeah my dogs and I'm like and I'm looking at his dogs and I'm like man I feel sorry for them dogs. They are not what you think they are, but you ha it has to be balanced. And you're not and you're you're not just doing it just to say you're doing it. If you can't afford to do it, then you can't afford to do it. Don't try to do it, you know. But if you can't afford to do it, then do it. But you want to use things: antioxidants, cherries, blueberries, mangoes, pineapple. All those things will help build a strong and healthy immune system while cleaning your dog system at the same time. Spinach, kale. People say, oh, don't use flaxseed because of the husk. Well, that's why you ground the flaxseed down. Now, no, you don't want to give them a ton of flaxseed. Just like even maybe just a teaspoon of flaxseed that is good for them. Ginger, I use powdered ginger, turmeric. All that stuff is good for their liver. It's good for their, like I said, their immune system, their heart. 
everything. So you have so many options on what you can do with things that me and you eat every day that they can also have. You know, I'm not saying go get them some goddamn Wagyu or some Kobe, you know what I mean, and, and medium rare it for them. That's not what I'm saying. If, if that's what you want to do and you can afford to do that, hey, great. I, I Even if I could afford to do that, I ain't, me and that dog going to be eating that steak together. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. But um, there's so many different types of meat. So don't just grab meat. you got to think about it like a bodybuilder. Why do they eat? The certain meat do they eat because they know it's going to do this. They know it's going to do that. So research the meat, research the alligator meat, research the salmon, research the quail, research the rabbit, research the chicken. What is it going to do? Okay, so if I combine this meat with this meat with these antioxidants and then I put some greens in there and then if you're getting whole prey, take those bones and make a stock out of those bones. And then use the carcass, break the carcass up and put it in their dog food. And then what I do with that stock is generally I make about a big pot of stock will give me, I'd say maybe about a, maybe about a gallon, gallon and a half. Cause I got one of those big pots for canning. So it'll give me about a gallon and a gallon and a half of stock or bone broth, whatever you want to, whatever you want to do. And you can do veggie broth at the same time. And I'll pour a cup of that over there, over the mill, because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a booster. Ginger, like I said, ginger, peas and carrots, uh, what's it called, Pump, raw pumpkin seeds in moderation are good for warming. Um, pineapple, if your dog is eating shit, use pineapple. At least in my case, it's worked, and I know a couple other guys that I've recommended it to, and they said it worked for them. Um, so, like I said, there's just no excuse, because you have so many options available other than just dry food. Um, and you can even make your own dry food and it would be better than most of the stuff you're going to buy at the store because at least you know what you're putting in it. But yeah, again, like I said, if, if I know I'm going to be taking my dogs to the lake to run, I'm going to give them a higher protein diet. And I'm also going to give them, you know, something to help with the immunity because they're going to be out, you know, they might step on something or, or eat something. They might even get bitten by something. So it's kind of like what you were saying in, in the interview. You're like, you don't want a dog. He's got a weak immune system that every time you take him out, this motherfucker's got a cold or he sneezes and he comes back with a wet nose. You know what I mean? No, I, and I understand that. Right. So that's that's how you. That's why you have to feed them. Don't just be like, oh, I'm doing the raw diet because I don't want to get laughed at. Mm. That's that's not a reason to do the raw diet. Right? The reason to do the raw diet is because you want your dogs to look the best that they can. But that's not to say that there aren't some good kibbles out here like there's there's a couple good kibbles out here there's a there's one in a, in in uh canada i can't i don't know the name but i'll get it i can get it easily um and i'll and i'll let you know so that way you can tell them or i'll talk about it if we end up doing a part two right but the only problem is with that good kibble like that you're getting like a 10 pound bag for 60 dollars mm. you know like i don't even want to afford that i don't get i don't care how good it is because i know i can make something better and that's what I'm telling people. Like, make it, you can make it better. You can design your own diet from the ground up based off what you want your dog to be doing or what it's going to be doing. And it's also, look at the breed of dog that you're getting. I don't care if it's a Chihuahua to a, to a fucking 200-pound a English Mastiff. Dogs are built to do different things. So if you're working your dog, then you need to be feeding it like it's a working dog. Now, if you've got a working dog that's sitting at home all day, I don't think you should be feeding it a high-protein diet in my place because, I mean, in, in my opinion, because that dog's going to have a lot of pent-up energy, and if he's not really getting out, you know, to, he's going to tear your house up. He's going to tear your yard up. You know, and then when you do walk him, you're going to he's got all this energy that's built up in him, and he's just going to... He's going to explode. Every time you open the door, he just explodes in and out of the door <laughs> on your house. Well, you're feeding him all this energy, and he's just sitting around in the house basically being a couch potato half the time. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, so you've got to keep that in mind. Like, you can design diets specifically for your breed. Um, so if there is anybody who wants me to design a diet for them, you know, you let me know. You, you find me on Instagram. And, you know, we'll, you tell me what you got going on and, you know, I'll, I'll see what I can do for you. Um, and, and also, I am working on a, a supplement that I'm going to be selling. Um, I just haven't sure if I'm going to do it in powder form for, to make like a shake. 
to pour on rather than just give it just the powder. Some stuff that I've been working on just for my own health, but it's also stuff that everything that a dog can have, you know. Because, mm. um, you know, anti-inflammatory things like beets, the greens from beets, like I said, again, ginger, um, uh, what else? What else can what else can you throw in there, man? It's, there's there's just so much so it's stuff. A, basically, I think basically, everything. I think I've, I've I've covered down there broccoli, fr- and you can look, you can and look, you can you can't be like, oh, I can't find this, I can't find that bullshit. You can go to Walmart and get eighty eight cent bags of peas and carrots. They got right. frozen blueberries, frozen so you're, strawberries, wait, wait, wait. You're frozen saying... berry mixes there. They sell tubs. And and containers of mm-hmm. chicken gizzards and chicken livers and, and that stuff's like a dollar, two dollars, dollar forty five, depending on where you live, it might be a little bit more right. expensive. But let me cut so, you off real quick. You're saying you're saying that you're creating a supplement that can be used for humans and canines. Yes. That's pretty dope. That's pretty dope. Yes. I, I like that idea. Yes. It's already, I've already started making it and people, you know, I've been giving it to my neighbors and they're loving it. And, uh, I've been giving it to my dogs and obviously, you know, dogs, they, they love it, but I'm waiting to see, you know, how it, what effect it's having on them. So, you know, I'm, and I'm only doing it with one dog. That way I can see if there is actually a difference in what I'm doing. So my one particular dog is getting just a whole different set of food than the other two. That way I can monitor what is actually going on, you know, if I need to change something, if I need to up something, you know, so I, I, I do certain things. Um, like I may not give her as much water one day because uh, you're getting the supplement that is kind of like a shake. It's almost like a like a protein shake, but it's not all protein. But, you know, and, and just to give people an idea, you know, what a protein shake is, you powder water, you mix it up, boom. But, yeah, that's basically what I'm doing is making something that is that can be consumed by humans and your canine. So you can drink one in the morning and they can drink one in the morning, mm. you know, and, That's and it, cool. and it, and so, and you know, I want it to be where you don't always have to give your dogs an extremely amount of pro a large, excuse me, I'm getting tongue tied here. So the purpose of it is so that you don't always have to have a ton of proteins in every single meal. I, you know, everybody, you know, if you got puppies, they may be eating, two to three times a day. If you've got older dogs, they may only be eating once, one big meal a day, or you may divide it up like I do into two meals a day. So then maybe he only gets that, that, that shake for dinner because he's getting such and such for, or maybe only gets a shake in the morning because he's getting such and such, you know, raw diet mix for dinner. So that is, that's what I'm doing right now. Um, you know, so guys look out for that because, you know, I, I work pretty quickly. So, I'm looking to have that like up and within like the next two months because by that time I'll be able to see if it is actually <clears throat> worth you know selling it to the public. There you go. <clears throat> That's dope. I like that idea. 